So for about two years, I've been involved in meetings with people, and all of us have a common goal, and that is to live on an eco-village. Ideally, to live on an eco-village in the Western Cape. We formed a group called Eco-Village Creation Western Cape, and at the Permaculture Festival, we met up with a group called Sacred Earth, which happened to have very similar objectives to us. When you look at it, they were the same. They were just phrased with different words. And so we decided to form a chapter of Sacred Earth Association so that we could network together. Because I think the only way to make this Eco Village project happen is to do some solid networking. <laughs> So, clearly we have a challenge here. How do we connect people and land? We've got lots of beautiful land in South Africa. That's not the problem. And we've got lots of people who would be just wonderful for this kind of project. Lots of talented, beautiful, energetic people. We can do this. And part of this process is trial and error. And if you listen, if you listen to those who will give us one intention advice, they say many intentional communities don't succeed and people often leave disappointed. Why is this so? So I've decided to phrase the talk in the following way, frame it. The two big challenges that we all face are community formation and land access. <laughs> So the slide is about answering the question, what is an intentional community? I would say the essence of an intentional community is the sharing of values between people that decide to come and do this project. And so I guess in our case, those values would be caring for the earth, really feeling like you're a part of nature, contributing actively to the cycles of nature, and then you get the free energy bonus. Isn't that nice? <laughs> Free energy is what you get when you work with nature. That's what I learned from your talk. <laughs> so, a group of people who share ecological values, practice permaculture, and we had several meetings in our eco village group that were preliminary, but over time we began to achieve quite a successful democracy process. And through this, we workshopped the vision document. The introduction to the vision document is. A group of people living as equals on a shared piece of land, working in harmony with nature and providing for our own food, energy, health and educational needs. So in an intentional community is a group of people who decide to get together and specifically do this, make it a part of the project. And creating communities is definitely getting easier. I mentioned that it was a trial and error process. And by this point, there is an actual university that's dedicated itself to teaching people how to form intentional communities. That's progress. <laughs> <laughs> and many of these teachings emphasize the challenges of working with people. Because when people come together to establish land, you, you have issues with differences of opinion. <laughs> have a lot of different cultures coming together, sometimes very fast. It's a challenge. And communication, we all know how hard communication is. It's really one of the hardest things that we need to do every day, yet it's just so necessary to learn how to communicate on a deeper level with each other. Because if we don't do that, we won't be able to create the necessary social cohesion that would keep the community together. And some of that also involves what I've called a realistic perspective. That's like knowing what the challenges are going to be. If you want to form an intentional community, you should know what the challenges are going to be. And you should study the kind of ways that you would need to get past those challenges. You can't just kind of get together and hope it will work. It's not enough. So I've listed these challenges as Developing a group of people with a diverse skill mix, and permaculture is quite high intensive skill. And 
The people have got to really trust each other and have to be genuinely committed, perhaps on quite a long term, to make such a thing work. This is one half of the challenges. <laughs> the other part of the challenges, I would say, is land access. And to some extent, money is a problem, but is it really our biggest problem? I'm not so sure. Like, the Western Cape, and land in the Western Cape is known to be especially expensive. But we as sacred earth are not looking just to find the ideal piece of land for ourselves, for an eco village for us, because there is no us, there's only a we. So, one of our present main operations is to create a usable database, a source online for people to go to to find land, find land where the owners are interested in starting eco projects. Because that's already a start to the project. It gives you a bit of an impetus to begin with. It allows you to be able to, you might have to call it, negotiate with the owner. But I mean, even negotiation would suggest that there's a bit of compromise involved. What if the owner is like so keen to start a project like today, and you can just find the land, and then that would be, I would call that an impetus to get the people together. And then those are the people that have to start workshopping the ideas of community and workshopping the democracy. People first, land first, neither, really. That's why I'm emphasizing a parallel approach. Otherwise you get stuck in a catch-22 situation. So, in December last year, there was a piece of land in the Western Cape that some members of Sacred Earth were very interested in buying. This land was called Williamsburg Mountain Reserve. And so it's here, yeah, quite near to the eastern end of the Western Cape border. But it was a huge farm, over a thousand hectares, and it had amazing water supply. So there were many things about this farm that excited members. And the owner started to become keen to sell it to Sacred Earth. And Sacred Earth held three gatherings at the farm with camping out sessions. And it was there that people raised a lot of their hopes and fears and all the challenges they would have to undergo like, in order to form an intentional community and what this would really mean to take a step like this. But within three months, the land was sold to somebody who was able to make a straight up cash offer of seven million. So that happens. And I would like to emphasize what we learned from that. Is that we learned that we have to try harder. We have to be more energetic about this process of networking people together because that's how we're going to get past this money issue. It's not from the banks. It's from the people. And the reason we are trying to do such a big project and why it's like necessary to get help with it is because we want to create a working model of ecologically conscious culture. We want to show people that it's possible and that it can be done. An intentional community following permaculture <laughs> principles. And we want to generate hives of activity. So there will be a lot of different activities going on. This eco-village will not just be for living, but it could be for farming, for education, for community development. And as a demonstration site. That way we can keep the momentum going for permaculture in South Africa. So Sacred Earth is a voluntary association. It's registered. And we're looking for people to come online and tell us about themselves and their farming interests and like whether they know about land, all sorts of interests like that to help us with the networking. And it will end up helping everybody because it will contribute to this database that we're building. Because I think that right now connecting information is important. We don't have all the information. We need more. 
And so one of the sacred objectives at the moment is to form a business entity that can hold land because an association by itself cannot legally hold land. And one possible solution for this, although I want to emphasize that this is not the solution, it's a solution, is to form a PTY Limited. Because they tend to be quite unregulated. PTYs can get away with more business activities. <laughs> and as we all know, there's a lot of getting away with to be done with the seat that was encroaching on us. And Monsanto lurking somewhere in the background. So, there may come a time in which we will need to have resistance, and the more power there is with us to resist, then let it be so. Although I would prefer for there to be no resistance. But let's just say that I can't be sure that such an outcome would happen. Mm -hmm. So, this is the list of objectives, but you, know, you can look at these later on the website. I'm not really going to emphasize these, except the first one which is creating working models of ecologically conscious culture, which I did actually mention before. And what that means is being able to show to people, because we are people, but we're also, we're quite at the, we're at the top of the curve, if you really think about it. We're a new form of society. There's no doubt about that. We, and in coming here today to decide to care better for the earth, we're ahead of a curve that the whole world is going to follow. So we need to bring it down, I guess, bring it down to the society because I do say it is down because I find the society quite destructive in many ways. We've really got to do better. You know, this is not good enough. The way this <laughs> civilization is run, it's really not good enough. I am dissatisfied. <laughs> so, um, our chapter members meet three times a week, you know, keep the admin flow. Admin is part of business, it's how it is. And because it's for a good purpose, I really enjoy it. Um, and if anybody here knows of land that they would like to tell us about, we've actually got a form that we brought with us that you can write it down. I'll bring the forms up. Or, you know what, get the forms from me, just like, come and meet me throughout the day. But let's rather do it that way, it'd be easier. So come and get the forms from you if you have to tell us about that, so that we can add it to our database. I just want to give two examples of what this would look like on our online database. Very short examples. So, there's one farm near Robertson that's 75 hectares. The owner wants people to move on who are doing permaculture. And I've put some details on it. There's another example. This one is also quite close to the border between the Eastern and the Western Cape. This one's a bit smaller. Yeah. Yeah, this is JP the Rue. Yeah, so what I'm trying to say is that these examples are happening mm -hmm. and these are the two examples that I've added to the draft notes of the website. And so we're welcoming more so that we can build up this database. I think it will solve the land access problem because if we connect people and land, land will be found. And if we work together, we will create community. These things do happen. This is just part of the process. Today's event is all part of an unfolding process. Mm -hmm. Just like the so-called failures of immune, uh, intentional communities, we can learn from those as being part of the process. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so there are many challenges associated with creating an intentional community. I hope I drove that point thoroughly. <laughs> um, but it is... I've studied um, a bit of systems theory and in the study of systems theory one of the main points of discussion is intervention points where you can change a system if you know a system needs to be changed where do you jump in where is that point that you decide and so this eco-village intentional community is the scale that seems most likely to me to work on a regional level if we want to make a difference it's on the eco-village scale that will have the greatest effect. 
because it will help towards changing paradigms about how people live. Changing paradigms is a powerful way to change society. And through this process, we shall activate our destiny of living consciously with nature. Mm -hmm. 